Hello, everybody. This is Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm excited for this 48th episode of the JewishRing.com show. We have a topic that I've been super duper excited to talk about for a while, and I've definitely been trying to get this guest on for literally months. I'm very excited to have Rabbi Andy Kosnowski on. Thank you for joining us today, Rabbi Kosnowski. My pleasure. Awesome. So the topic today we are discussing is on alcoholism, right? Alcohol abuse, especially in the contemporary Jewish community. Is that right, Rabbi Kosnowski? That is correct. I'm very excited. Before we go on, I want to mention to people out there a little bit, a super duper brief bio, Rabbi Kosnowski, just so you have a little bit of context on her. She's currently a senior rabbi of a congregation in Lombard, Illinois, in the greater Chicagoland area, correct? Yes. And originally from New York, she moved to Nashville, Tennessee after college and then got the calling to go to rabbinical school in 1999, finishing in 2005. And decade and a half later, she is now on this podcast. So thank you, Rabbi Kosnowski, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here, Drew. Thank you for having me. My total pleasure. So one thing that when I, very, when I started announcing to the world in September 2019, I'm creating JewishDream.com, instantly on Facebook, people said, wait a second, are you encouraging alcoholism, alcohol abuse, bad behaviors? Like, what's the deal? I immediately created a page, put it on the website, hey, resources for alcoholism, alcohol abuse. Uh, it's, I think it's definitely part of the conversation. And I think uh, this is a, it could be another conversation about the first couple, uh, for, certainly the first story when it comes up of drinking in the Bible in Genesis with Noah getting drunk. And I think that's an interesting conversation as far as in Jewish life, we like to talk about Kiddush and using wine at various other ceremonial rituals, weddings, uh, bar, uh, brises, etc. But there's also you know, there's, I think people, there's, you know, the ceremonial drinking, there's drinking, drinking, and then there's also an extreme, which does appear in human life, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's something I, I'm very curious to discuss with you, Rabbi Kisnowski. It sounds like you've, you, um, well, so when, when we got connected, I got very excited because this is something that needs to be part of the conversation here for JewishRing.com, right? I agree. And I was so thrilled when you called me. I'm glad we have mutual friends that knew to put us together. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to understand that for those people who can safely drink, drinking is a wonderful thing. Uh, wine gladdens the heart. Uh, yep. It's something that is part of all of our Jewish rituals, like you mentioned. And I think it's wonderful for people to be able to drink. I think it's also important to understand that, you know, Reformed smokers are like the worst because they always try to arbitrate what other people are doing vis-a-vis -vis smoking. Um, oh, really? <laughs> well, I, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Um, I've never smoked in my life. It's like the one addiction I've been spared from. Hmm. So, but I, I giggle because I, I do not have a problem with other people drinking. I think it's wonderful that they can, if they can do it safely, all the power to them. Unfortunately, I am not able to safely drink. And so um, I believe in live and let live. And so if I have a problem with other people drinking, then I would still have a drinking problem. Mm. Yeah. So how I, did you, if you, if you don't mind sharing, how did you discover that? Well, um, little did I know that um, I come from a family of where alcoholism is just rampant in our family, you know, just by my last name, Kosnowski, Kosnowski, I'm from my ancestry's Polish. And I didn't realize that, you know, in Poland, it's quite the, uh, it's, it's the tradition to drink. And so my parents enjoyed um, fine vodka, if you will. Yep. And, uh, and so for me, you know, alcoholism was never discussed in our family. But Wait, can, I, can I just interrupt? Please. I, I think for, for viewers and, and watchers of jewishring.com they understand that fine vodka is not an oxymoron and that it actually can exist oh it does exist yes yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, i don't know why people abuse alcohol by adding things like orange juice and uh other additives i mean even an ice cube can be abusive a vodka should come out of the freezer <laughs> and be drank straight like is there any alcohol other alcohol can be rough for some people they want to <laughs> Let's just say I never drank uh, for the taste of alcohol. I always drank for the effect and what it did for me. Oh, uh, okay. There are some people who actually enjoy the taste. Oh, I'm sure there are, but that was not my experience. Uh, my experience is more of the, I drank for effect 
And mm -hmm. uh, yes, okay. So the quick story is I, I am originally from New York. I grew up a conservative Jew in uh, the suburbs of New York City. And again, a very traditional upbringing. Uh, I went through B'nai Mitzvah, I went to Hebrew high school, went to Israel when I was 16 years old with USY, never drank. One day uh, I lost my voice and I was actually the, the star in my senior play. And my mom said to me, gosh, you lost your voice two nights before opening night. You know, before, um, before Papa would go to bed every night, he would have a shot of vodka. And he said, you know, a shot of vodka every night before bed would do um, wonderful things for him. So why don't you go ahead and have a shot of vodka? And sure enough, two nights later, my voice had returned. Uh, the shot got a little bit bigger every night after that. And um, I was done with drinking from the time I was 17. I was done by the time I was 20. And I was totally, uh, I had pretty much lost everything that was worthwhile in life. So I had dropped out of college twice. My parents were just baffled, like what had happened to their nice Jewish girl daughter. Yeah. And, um, but I, at 20 years old, I understood that uh, it, drinking wasn't working anymore. It had basically turned on me. And mm -hmm. so I, I checked myself into a rehab, ended up in a halfway house. Again, this was not the life that my parents had raised me to be living in a halfway house, if you will. But yeah. it really was the best thing that could have happened to me because I really had to say, you know, how badly do I want to um, quit drinking? And I understood for me, Drew, mm -hmm. if I didn't quit drinking, uh, I wasn't going to make it to my 30th birthday. So. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's a good realization, especially to have it at a young age. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, I haven't had a drink since December of 1988. Wow, that's really great. Well, actually, when I was 18 years old, I knew even by 18 that I had a problem. So I went to my rabbi, my conservative rabbi. Oh, yeah. He said to me, I walked in, I said, look, rabbi, I'm, I think I'm having this problem with drinking. And he said to me, Jews aren't alcoholics. So, wow. yeah, it was very wow. And unfortunately, I was uh, a Hebrew school teacher in that particular shul at the time. And yeah. I was just looking for some kind of spiritual guidance. I really, I was very lost and I was, I just, so it kept me kind of out of, um, away from getting help because I thought, well, if Jews aren't alcoholics, then what is my problem? Um, you know, I hear people telling, you know, saying, you know, Jews don't have a problem with alcohol, da, 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 but it's strange to just use that flippant, like it's one thing to broadly describe the situation, but someone coming to you specifically just, that's, Strange. That's shocking. Okay. That's really bearing a head in the sand sort of action. Well, I think there was so, we knew so little about alcoholism in the Jewish community. I was grateful when I did uh, find help that I, I got hooked up with Jax at the time. Do, mm -hmm. Have you introduced your readership to Jewish alcoholic chemically dependent spouses? Somehow they have this really long acronym that comes out to Jax, J-A-C-S. And um, it was very helpful. It made me feel less different, at least in the beginning, uh, when That's I good. was getting sober, it was nice to know there were other Jewish alcoholics that I was not the only enigma yeah. from the tribe that went bad. That's really good. And so my interaction with Jax is when I was in rabbinical school, I attended a weekend retreat with Shabbat Shabbaton for Jax. Great. So, super duper fasting on so many, so many levels. I still remember, I don't know, I was sitting at one meal. This woman didn't have a problem with alcohol, but she had a problem with food. She literally brought out a, weight, a weighing measure and she would put her food on it. And then she literally told me, she's like, I shouldn't be doing this. My doctor said I shouldn't be using a weight, but like I got to measure my food. So that was really, that was really crazy. But more relevant to our purposes is the developing the sensitivity to offer grape juice at Kiddish's or other Jewish events not only to offer alcohol, but to offer a non-alcoholic option, which blew my mind. Like it's a, probably for people who are in the know and aware, it's like super obvious and simple. But for me, I wasn't aware of this and didn't even, like it literally never even dawned on my mind to offer grape juice. Right, so I have so, a great story for you, a great yeah. story. When I was, uh, I was interviewing for my current position, uh, I, was, I came in to the congregation as an assistant and uh, after I was pretty clear that I had a good shot at getting the job, I had a heart-to-heart -heart with the senior rabbi. And I said to him, Rabbi, 
you need to hear from me before you hear it from like the street um, that I am a recovering alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I need you to understand that, uh, that you don't have to do anything about it. I'm in charge of my own sobriety, my own recovery. I was 15 years sober at the time, Mm -hmm. but I just needed him to know about it. Mm -hmm. What he did was, it was like uh, December of the year that, you know, I, they hired me in December to start in July. He went to the board and said, we've, we've become aware that it's, it's irresponsible for us to be filling the kiddish cup with wine because the bar mitzvah kids can get into it. Why don't we start filling it with grape juice? Oh, wow. So a non-issue. So he was uh, practicing the, um, the commandment or if you will, the value of low boucher. He did not want me to be embarrassed to have to ask for the kiddish awesome. cup to be filled with grape juice. He started six months before I arrived, changing mm-hmm. the minhag, changing the custom, so that when I arrived, it was always filled with grape juice. As oh, if incredible. it's always been done that way. <laughs> that's really fantastic. And so what, so in addition to kiddish, and, and I guess kiddish is at shul and other sort of events, or even just having a Shabbat dinner and not only offering wine to guests, but offering grape juice as an option, what, how have you seen alcohol abuse play out in the Jewish community? And whether it's in a more public fashion or even in a more private, smaller group fashion, how have you seen that play out? Um, I guess, you know, it's, I'm going to ask you in twofold, one more problematically and what solutions uh, or best practices do you have to recommend? Right. So if I, um, if I were the master of the universe, I would say, um, we always want to be sensitive to everyone in our midst. That being said, if we're going to be offering alcohol at, as an option at our events, we always have to have a non-alcoholic option. So it's not okay to just offer wine and water. There should be wine, mm-hmm. soft drinks, coffee, water, whatever. But it's that idea of it, there should always be an array of offering. Drinking choices. That is correct. And this way, it's not this um, that we're coercing anyone to drink alcoholic beverages, but rather we offer the choice. Everyone gets to have their autonomy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I am, you know, as a, as a senior rabbi, I say to my leadership, please feel free to have events that have alcohol there. I think, again, widen mm-hmm. gladdens the heart. We want to encourage people to come and make merry. I, I think it's a wonderful way to be, what's the word, uh, social and engaging. On the other hand, we have AA meetings at our congregation, so I can offset the idea that we have alcohol by saying, you know, if somebody has a problem, we have a sensitivity to know that we also have to offer a solution. So that is well, I think it's an important thing. I think I personally think that every congregation should offer AA in their basement, just as church basements hold AA. Mm. But um, again, it's just that idea of heightened sensitivity that no one should ever be afraid of housing an AA meeting because it's not Christian and it's not overtly religious. It's an opportunity for people to go to hear a solution. It's not the solution. It's not the only solution. It is an option. And this way, why can't we offer uh, alcohol in our building? We also offer a solution. So, so it sounds, those are definitely more of the solutions. And it sounds like the problems are more on local, more on the, the personal level. But have you, have you seen it playing out in a more public fashion? No. Prob- in a problematic way. Right. Um, no, honestly. Uh, oh, okay. I, I feel, but, and then again, I might be in tremendous denial of my own congregants, but um, we haven't had that issue. Go ahead. So it's more of an invisible problem, right? It's not as noticeable to right. people. So, I mean, I think we have to also be sensitive to your point where that lady had brought the, the you know, the scale to dinner. Yeah. Should we not offer sugar because there's an overeater in the room, like somebody mm-hmm. who's overeaters anonymous or... You know, so again, we just want to be sensitive to say we give adults autonomy and choice and they get to um, make their decisions. If they have lost the ability to choose whether or not they can drink safely, whether or not they can eat certain foods safely, 
mm-hmm. then they, they have to deal with that on their terms. We, yeah. I don't feel like it's up to us to arbitrate other people's decisions. Yeah, cool. All right, so you, we've mentioned a couple of organizations, groups out there, AA, JAX. What national, and, and it's really fascinating as far as talking about JAX and finding that there are other Jews who are struggling with these issues. So if people wanted to find out in a national sense what resources there are, are out there for Jewish alcoholics, you know, people who abuse alcohol, what, what's out there? Um, I'd say I always like to check with Rabbi Google. That is the go-to place to okay. find out what is local to a person's area yeah. that they can go to. And I would have to say to keep an open mind, I don't believe that there's any one cure for alcoholism. I think everybody has to find their path. So, mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I can't diagnose anybody as alcoholic. I can only diagnose myself, but I think it's important to keep spreading the word of that help is out there and you have to find the place that can help you just as mm-hmm. others have found the place that helped them. Okay. I was a, my next question is more local to you in the Chicago land area. Are there some Chicago land specific Jewish resources for those in such a category? Oh, tremendous. Yes. Uh, yeah. So JCFS, there's the Jewish, you know, healing network. There's a whole bunch of Jewish resources mm-hmm. of help that's available to alcoholics or people who are potential alcoholics or families of alcoholics, or they're not sure if they're alcohol, you know, it's, um, but help is here for sure. That's yeah, great. In the bigger cities. That's, yeah, I mean, that is one of the, certainly in the tri-state area of New York and New Jersey and all that, there's plenty and there's Beit Teshuva in LA, which is a great resource. And yeah, yeah so it's one of the great things about the bigger Jewish cities. Yes. Didn't Beit Teshuva also like build a New York outreach? Oh, that was could have. Ending that they were trying to see if they could replicate the success from Good LA. for them. Yeah, they Good do great work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you have any other advice for, you know, on the other end for other people who want to create a welcoming space for, for those who may be struggling with alcoholism or alcohol abuse, or maybe be someone who's on the sober end of it? How do you offer advice, guidance, best practices for being sensitive and welcoming to sort of the Jewish community writ large, aside from, I mentioned the tactic earlier of offering grape juice, and that was a really awesome strategy that your, the, that senior rabbi did of changing the, the minhag of the, the congregation half a year pre- previous to your starting. Are there other ways that you think uh, could be helpful and welcoming? So um, I used to, when I was able to, I used to schlep back from Chicago to Cincinnati to actually speak to the graduating class at Hebrew Union College of rabbinical students. Oh, wow. And one of the things that I used to teach about was that um, we clergy cannot help alcoholics as clergy. That if you get a congregant that comes to you that has a problem with alcohol and or drug addiction, Um, the clergy cannot help them. They can set them up with other members uh, who have recovered from alcoholism, but we can't help them as just people. Alcoholics that are not treated take a tremendous amount of resources. So I always encourage rabbis, cantors, uh, people who want to be uh, aligned with those who are addicts, to educate themselves about the resources that exist to be able to help alcoholics find the help that they need. That really the people who can help alcoholics are other alcoholics. So we have to set Uh, them up with places that they can find other alcoholics to find a solution for them. That we as, we can't apply Jewish teaching that will cure alcoholism. It's sort of like putting a Band-Aid on a broken arm. It, it looks like mm-hmm. you're helping, but it's not doing so much. That's really fascinating. I definitely never knew that. So that's really, it's, it's refer, 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 refer for the yeah, rabbis yeah. Well, and, and other clergy. Educate yourself that um, if somebody's coming to you with um, a tremendous amount of problems that seem astonishingly difficult to solve, it might not be the problems themselves, but something underneath that that looks huh. like addiction, so. Oh, wow. It's really, that's intriguing. Yes. 
But also to remind everyone that, you know, um, alcoholism does run in families. It does run in Jewish families. Mm -hmm. And then you can also have somebody who just ends up alcoholic and doesn't have anyone that in their family tree that was ever an alcoholic. Go figure. Mm. Wow. I can tell a couple of stories that you can take. Yeah. And, and flip stories out. are great. You want stories are good. Yeah. Stories are great. Yeah. See? Yeah. When I turned 20 years of sobriety, I knew that it was time for me to start talking to my congregation about uh, the fact that I have recovered from alcoholism. Hmm. And it was also um, difficult because there was some shame involved and I didn't realize how much shame that I was carrying after 20 years of not having had hmm. a drink. Uh, but my parents were members of my congregation and I was going to be go telling a thousand people publicly that I am an alcoholic. And yeah. even though I had not had a drink in 20 years, I did not realize that there was still some shame about it. Mm -hmm. So I took the risk and I went ahead and told a little bit of my recovery story on Yom Kippur, the one day where we had the highest attendance uh, in the mm -hmm. shul. Wow. And I thought, well, either I'm going to lose my job or uh, I just didn't know what was going to happen. And what yeah. ended up happening was that a path was, was, you know, forged to the door of my office. Everybody came to me to tell me their story of their father, their brother, their spouse, their child who had issues with alcohol addiction or, you know, drug, whatever kinds of addiction. And it made me much more human and approachable as, oh, wow. a, as a rabbi. So mm -hmm. to encourage people to not always be so anonymous with their struggle, if you will, it mm -hmm. was a very powerful time that changed, I would have to say, the trajectory of my, my rabbinate. Wow. How, wait, how so? What happened? So that was 2008, oh. right? So then what happens after, or so, is it 2009? It was, it was 2000, it was probably the Yontif of 2008. Okay. And it was just, um, as I said, I, I, it was actually, well, maybe 2009. It was back then. Um, yes. It basically, um, I had become the associate by then. So again, I had had a little bit of cred. Um, yeah. But I really have to say that I think part of why I have been uh, at this congregation for the past 15 years is because, again, that sermon, if you will, changed me from being, oh, the rabbi to, oh, you know, the human. And it was really a wow. message. So you were more approachable. People felt they could come more relatable, right, right. as a person. But also wow. understand that I spent one paragraph on me and spent the rest of the sermon on mental illness. And oh, basically wow. was saying, hey, we all have mental illness in our families. I'll go first. And I talked wow. about my struggle and invited them to, to share theirs. And it really opened up our congregation to being able to offer resources for mental mm -hmm. health of all different kinds. Oh, wow, that's really incredible. That's a really awesome story. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pick up a, I'm, I'm curious. So what about as a, as a person who's, an alcoholic who's been sober, is that, a, how do you, is that the right way to say it? That is correct, sure. That's okay. How does it, how do you orient yourself to people when they, they are drinking, whether it's a, a, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the Jewish life piece, but it could also just be like in a social event and people are drinking. Yeah, how do you orient yourself? How do you, how do you frame that? So you? Drew, you have to understand that for me, again, if I say that I am recovered alcoholic, mm -hmm. other people's drinking doesn't affect me mm -hmm. as long as I stay spiritually fit. Okay. I have a spouse that drinks. I have parents that drink. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a non-issue because mm. alcohol is everywhere. I don't ask other people to not drink because I'm there. What I do is I make sure that I'm, I've done my work for the day that enables me to go anywhere and be of service to other people. Mm. Uh, and what, what they're doing does not affect me uh, one way or the other. That's really great. That's really great. It's like live and let live. You know, it's a, you practice the principle of, uh, other people get to be the uh, arbiters of their own experience and they have their own uh, autonomy. I'm not here to judge. Yeah. I know what I can and can't do, but they have to find their, their boundaries. That's, that's really great. That's excellent. I'd like to talk to you about some of the ways that um, alcohol affected me in that 
you know, I stopped drinking before I was of legal drinking age. And I made a lot of mistakes from the time I was 17 to the time I was 20. Mm. I actually went to Israel. My sister was living in Israel at the time she married an Israeli man. And uh, I made some decisions based on myself that um, affected my sister and her husband. And so mm. they had to ask me to leave. I was living with them and, or staying with them, if, if you will. And they, they had to ask me to leave. And um, because my behavior was putting them in jeopardy. And I was actually so proud of them for having the, uh, the ability to do that. Because really why I got sober, Drew, was because I had to start facing my own consequences. Mm. And so uh, as hard as it was and heart-wrenching as it was for my sister to say, you can't stay here anymore. Um, I'm very proud of her for being able to do that. Mm, when I, um, I had to actually fly back to Israel to make a direct amends to people that I had harmed. Oh, and wow. my sister and, and brother-in-law being part of the, that list, if you will. Yeah. And thankfully, um, they were able to see not just the words that I was using change, but my behavior had changed. Hmm. And they received my amend. And the, the word amend, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> too much talking. <laughs> the word amend means to change. And mm -hmm. so they had seen that I had changed how I was living my life. So it was easier to accept the amend. Robert Kisnowski, thank you so much for joining us today. This is really excellent. Thank you, Drew, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. This is, I'm, I'm so glad we can make this happen finally after, you know, months and months. So this is, this is really great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Drew, I'd like people to be able to contact me if they yes. would like to. Definitely. So I want to give a couple of different ways they can reach me. I have a blog that um, I do. It's kind of a spiritual blog, if you will. Sure. And it can be reached at www.spirituallens.com. It's all one word, spirituallens.com. Mm -hmm. Or my email, which is just Rabbi Kosnowski at Kong Etzchaim, like Congregation Etzchaim, cool. kongetzchaim.org. Awesome. Great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. This is fantastic. And l'chaim. L'chaim. Okay.